and welcome to the 50th episode of our Comics Burst series from the Full Force podcast, sponsored by Distant Planet Comics and Collectibles, where we take an in-depth look at the newest G.I. Joe comics and related titles of the week, with me as your host, Chris, Space Knight of the Old Republic McLeod, aka Diagnostic 80. <laughs> Joining me on this episode is Brian in Hemorrhoids Hickey. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> On this bum-painful landmark 50th instalment of your absolutely favourite kind of burst, we look at the second issue in a brand new series connected to the old IDW combined universe, Rom Diorates. So without further ado, let's get stuck into this comics burst. One Small Step for Diorate Kind, Part 2. 1969, the first lunar mission has landed and they aren't alone. Trapped, hunted by diorathes, the astronauts find themselves wishing that help weren't over 200,000 miles away. A wraith invasion of Earth is looming and only the most isolated men in human history stand in their way. Plus, the connected ROM backup with art by Guy Dorian Sr. and ROM legend Sal Buscema continues here. Brian, right? This was this is kind of a long time in coming, wasn't it? The uh, the second issue, but it's finally here with us. Excited? Absolutely. I mean, Chris Royal, I, I think he's done a superb job in this issue. It gets dark, folks. It gets dark. <laughs> it certainly does. So let's get through the details in this one. So one small step for Die the Wraith, kind part two. Writer Chris Ryle, artist Luca and Andrea Pizzari. Colorist Jim Boswell, letters Sean Lee, and obviously you've got the One Small Step for a Space Night Part 2 backup story, again written by Chris Ryle, artist Guy Dorian Sr. and Scott Hanna, colorist Ross Campbell uh, with Sean Lee on letters again. We get three very nice covers on for this one, three really different covers too, but all very, very cool. So obviously the first one I have, cover A, which is a uh, Luca Pizzari cover, uh, I guess he does the colours on this one as well. Uh, and it's just basically one of the astronauts, either Buzz or Neil, with the reflection of the die wraith coming towards him in the in the visor. What do you think of that one, Brian? I, I mean, I love this. I mean, of course, you know, the, the moon landing shots, the classic moon landing shots are famous for those reflections in the visor. So obviously he's playing on that, but it totally captures the bulk of the action of how, what's happening in this issue. So that's um, uh, Luca Pizzari's work on this is... I mean, it's just beautiful. We also have cover B, which is Corin Howell and colours by Priscilla Tramontano. And this one is really cool and really eerie, horrible vibe because you've got the uh, what you've got the kind of footprints of the astronauts and obviously the stalking foot of one of the diorates kind of like, you know, creeping up on the astronauts. Like it's a really dark cover, this one, isn't it? That is there's almost this kind of monotone feel to the to the moon soil or dust and with the, the footprints in there and then you got the the only bit of color is that clawed foot Ugh. of the diorite and it's um again very nice touch very nice cover yeah very suspenseful and eerie and, and scary I, I like that one uh, and then we have a throwback uh, artist guy dorian senior and ross campbell on colors uh, for the retail incentive cover and that's the kind of diorate, almost like playing puppet master with the with Rom and the astronauts, which is again a nice touch, isn't it? This is actually my favourite cover. The detail in that diorate and well, in, in all of the the action here mm. is fantastic. And it's, I suppose it looks more at the the bigger story rather than kind of honing in on any individual events in this issue. Uh, I think this is a really really nice beautiful cover absolutely so three cracking covers we've been kind of waiting for this issue for a while now and it's it's here so first off we start again where we left off effectively with uh hank armstrong he is obviously a diorath now and he is ho he is honing in on michael collins in the shuttlecraft that's kind of you know orbiting the moon waiting for neil and buzz to stop fecking about and get back and get back now while that's happening and while we're seeing hank armstrong's kind of uh movements should we say in that initial page 
we are taken back to the the fight that's going on between the diorites and the astronauts. Okay, so this is a really nice kind of setup. Hank Armstrong, he is now a diorite. He's on his way to uh, the you know Apollo spacecraft in orbit over the moon, but it then flashes back to where we left off last month or yeah. the last issue, where the diorite warriors had attempted to attack or to you know a surprise attack the astronauts, but the low gravity they weren't prepared to do battle in that. <laughs> I love that scene when he goes flying past them completely mess up their their surprise attack and now we have a scenario where our astronauts are fighting back and our astronauts as it turns out are well used are well prepared to to fight and work in a low gravity environment so we have what looks like i think it's buzz aldrin i think is the the first one we see i think so because he he mentions that he's talking about the captain in the yeah like as if he's another person which obviously is uh is uh neil isn't it must be Neil so Buzz is well able to kind of jump over or you know avoid these kind of tentacles or you know this, these, these elongated arms that come out of the diorite and I love how he very quickly lands a punch on the diorite kind of shutting it up knocking it to the ground and you know I suppose in classic kind of Buzz Aldrin uh, fighter jock fighting spirit he's like I've got 10 reasons of why you're not going to take me down you've just met five of them now you're going to meet the other five uh, so it's you know it's some nice kind of action here and lots of kind of retro tough guy talk in with a bang issue number two and i really love when the diorite changes his kind of hand in one of his fists into like this massive (laughs) like spiky hideous weapon and he's about to he's got buzz by the neck and he's about to absolutely smash him into it but buzz is holding him off actually still uh he's he's stopped he blocks him with the first swing and as he comes back to take another swing with this hideous weapon he gets blown off and and in come the inhumanauts fantastic i mean again you turn the page and here they are you've got uh kiev on her knees holding the smoking gun and i absolutely love that she got to bring a weapon out on the field despite the protests of her colleagues and they're still protesting and- it they even say like that's the last of that and a good shot but that's the last we can't of what we can't risk any you know like the uh, the astronauts or the shuttlecraft getting getting shot so she's like okay fine i can do close combat as well that's that's in my skill set which is which is really cool. So we've got the Inhumanauts are now kind of there to help, and then the Dire Wraith just disappears, which is really weird, isn't it? Just kind of like disappears. Just, whew, this like blue vapor, whew, it's gone, and uh, they're all kind of left a little bit stumped. Of course, we don't know what we we know. It's not revealed yet what's going to happen with Neil Armstrong and the Dire Wraith that he's battling against. But before we find that out, it cuts back to Armstrong, who's now just docked with the Apollo spacecraft. And he's explaining to Michael Collins that you know there's a communications blackout. Collins can't get in contact with anybody, Houston or the astronauts on the ground. He's no idea what's going on. And Armstrong, or you know, AKA the diorate wizard, is explaining to him that there's been a change of plans. And uh, he looks very menacing as he's standing there in the airlock about to board Apollo. And like Collins is very, you know, he's aware that there's something wrong here. He's like, he, you know, you know this why are you coming over here to see me why are you asking these questions and then you see that his eyes go green and it's like uh so but we don't know what happens at that point we don't know what happens to collins at that moment i have a feeling he isn't a diorate necessarily and he's done something to stop hank from from kind of like further you know getting into his or killing him or even like getting into his body to use as a host i mean i I kind of want that to be the case but judging by how the rest of this issue goes i don't think he's gonna make it (laughs) i think i think the astronauts are safe in this one i think they're being used as a foil for the issue because what happens then is we flip back and we've got um now we well now we have the captain now we have neil armstrong in his battle with a diorate he's by the module the land the lander and you've got this new this other diorate warrior attacking him and he's keeping him at bay and obviously the inhumanauts like the other inhumanauts they've split up to help each each astronaut and we've got this disappeared diorate and we you know we don't know what's going on with it and then it starts to appear doesn't it what what's happening yeah this is where things really start to take kind of a dark turn i've liked this kiev character like right from the onset i thought she was pretty kick ass yeah clearly the diorite that disappeared didn't actually disappear. It has made its way in through her boot, 
and into her armor and has actually taken over Kiev's body. And she initially she can see this kind of look of fear in her face. She knows something is not right. She goes down and then gets back up saying that I'm feeling better, better than you, human. And that's when you realize she's now a diorite. Yep. And then what really just transpires from this moment on is the Inhumanauts getting kind of taken apart piece by piece so obviously Kiev explodes out of her uniform like like a John gear. Carpenter the thing it's a proper, <laughs> proper horror movie isn't it and then that attacks Orbison and then Flannery who has his mask kind of broken and then he's kind of like di- like you know he's struggling to breathe and his eyes are popping in his just head and explodes in space yeah but oh. then the die wraith kind of infiltrates him as well so you've got all this kind of stuff going on with so we've lost two inhumanauts now three inhumanauts in actual fact Kiev Flannery and Orbison. We've got Brightside left and the lady on the space station. I can't. Sandra Shaw. Yes, that's that's. I think that's all we've got left on the uh, Inhumanauts. Yeah, in the Adventure One team. And what's quite interesting is then they're called Adventure Team in this as well. So it's it, it's fun how they're kind of tying in all of these kind of G.I. Joe and Hasbro brand kind of th- things in there as well. And we don't actually get... Obviously, the first part was called Inhumanauts. This is called One Small Step for Wraith Kind. So we've moved away from the Inhumanauts as a... Uh, I suppose as like a name for this group and they've just been they've been called by you know one of the astronauts the adventure team in this so I I wonder if you know Inhumanauts is still a thing necessarily for this group I don't know if this group will even exist at the end of this (laughs) very good point (laughs) but it's you know it's a nice well if we're bringing this back to the combined universe that, that was put out there a couple of years back, probably we can make the connection back to Joe Colton's adventure team that we see in the in, in the combined universe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from a couple of years back. Who you know, again, Joe Joe Colton and Miles Mayhem, that they would have been young guys working together probably around the same time that this group or all this action's happening up on the moon. So I wonder if this is a different faction of a more expanded adventure team. Yeah, yeah, totally, absolutely. And I love how the Inhumanoids have been kind of brought into this. And what I really like, and I'll flash up a, a, an image of the uh, the Inhumanoid kind of Earth core the, from the originals, and they all have that the, the same colour schemes going on. Obviously, Herc Armstrong, uh, obviously it's Hank Armstrong in this issue, but Herc Armstrong would have been the one that wore green in the past. So it's interesting that Kiev is rocking that because the other the other guys, you know, and, and the other thing is they show like some really cool, like all the, all the, the suits show those kind of specialties. So you've got like the yellow suit, which is like, you know, you, they, the kind of ice, which kind of like shoots the die wraith and kind of freezes it. Uh, you've got Kiev, who's kind of like the weapons. You've got uh, the other guys who have got like the kind of close range kind of drills and saws and all that kind of stuff. So there's all these kind of cool touches that they've gone with to tie in the Inhumanoids, which I really, really like. So anyway, th- this group of Inhumanoids, unfortunately, get absolutely wiped out bar Brightside, who's with Neil Armstrong. Armstrong, yeah. And Armstrong, at this point, he decides that as a weapon against the die wraith that's fighting these two guys, he's going to use the American flag. <laughs> and he pulls yeah. it out of the ground and unleashes it on the uh, on the die wraith, which is amazing. It's incredibly patriotic and exactly what you'd expect from Neil Armstrong, yep. but also totally brilliant idea because you've got no, very low, low gravity, no atmosphere for kind of friction and you've got this you know, really sharp point on the end of the of the, the flagpole it becomes a lethal missile which is able to pierce the diorate's armor and he gets the first strike strike one for for the earth guys come on finally we get a, a win there <laughs> and then we flip back again to the other situation the, around the other side of the uh, of the module and it's really dark because you see the, the disembodied like the oh. head, like laying next to the feet of the uh, still standing upright. Is it Orbison? I think that one's Orbison, isn't it? Yeah, it's Orbison. Yeah. So his head is on the ground, and then you see another panel. You see the head, the, the blood just floating off, and the, the the low gravity. It's pretty horrific. And of course, Aldrin, you know, makes a makes a bit of a run first and collides with um, with Armstrong. And that kind of gets them the distance away that they need, doesn't it? Yeah. That's it. They essentially float across the surface of the moon to get as far away from the, the, the diorates as possible. And then again, we, we flip over to Adventure 2, which is the ship that Sandra Shaw was in, and Armstrong. 
we have the other Dire Wraith that's kind of like the other kind of like wizard Dire Wraith kind of like approaching Adventure 2 to fly off and, you know... Uh, actually, sorry, Sandra Shaw's on the... Uh, she was on the space station, wasn't she? So she's on the space this station. This is the yeah. landed adventure two that had the Inhumanauts on it. My apologies. So she is now broadcasting from Adventure One, and she's trying to tell Earth that she hid away while the Diorath attacked her Armstrong, and she saw what it did to him. And she's trying to get that kind of like information to Earth, which I think she does. Uh, she does manage to do. And the, the Diorath says, "I don't care." If you're going to get that information to Earth, I'm still going to go there and kill everyone and so on and so forth. So it gets in the Adventure 2 and flies off. And now we have dire situation, pardon the pun. Bright side and the two astronauts are, you know, are still on the moon. And they have to work out a way of getting on the module and, and getting back to Michael Collins. And that's when the other dire wraith kind of appears, uh, still not defeated. And he is kind of like explaining to them... Or giving a, giving the game away, should we say, all the history of the Dire Wraiths and the Space Knights. So yeah, I mean, this was uh, so, so while the guys are getting a chance to sort of recoup, they've obviously got away from, or Aldrin's got away from the Dire Wraith that he was fighting against. We get a little bit of exposition here. So the guys are kind of you know, they're asking these questions like we didn't think there was life out there, etc. And then this Dire Wraith catches up. Obviously, eavesdropping on the conversation and decides to weigh in and and give them a little bit of backstory on who the Dire Wraiths are, who the Soul Star Knights are, even though the Soul Star Knights are not even in this particular sequence of events yet. Yeah. I thought that was a bit unusual. It kind of broke the flow a little bit for me, but I understand the importance of getting some exposition in there because, you know, not everybody who reads this will have you know, may necessarily be familiar with, you know, the previous kind of ROM comics that came out as part of the conjoined universe. I feel like it's a way of actually allowing those human characters though to know what's going on like it's almost like you know how would they understand what's going on unless this was explained to them in this way so i understand why it's done but at the same time i'm the same as you it does it stops the flow a hundred percent like all of a sudden there's no battle going on all of a sudden there's this kind of conversation between the enemies and then the last thing it says it says you know no one's going to stand against us and it just explodes out of its armor and is about to fight all through about to you know try and fight all three of them at once and you kind of that's the panel that you're left with and then it's like three stages so you've got the diorath on adventure two approaching or going past adventure one and then you've got michael collins kind of all of a sudden he's there he doesn't look like he's a diorath armstrong isn't near him so i wonder what's happened between armstrong and collins because we haven't we don't know that information we don't where, know and that's where that particular element of the story ends which is like what so so we've got essentially a direct warrior battling with aldrin neil armstrong and dodger brightside down on the surface of the moon we've got direct wizard in the adventure two lander looks like he's making his way to the space station where sandra shaw is and and then michael collins is he a dire wraith or is he not a dire wraith we don't know and i suppose that's what i'm really looking forward to finding out in issue number three absolutely and that what what is sad to me though is that i wasn't aware this was only a three-parter and i wonder if that's actually happened on purpose but obviously it, get, it says to be concluded in the next issue so for me i'm kind of like i was really enjoying this and i was hoping it would get you know a little further on and we get back to earth and and other things would happen like that but what i feel is going to be happening is they're going to tie this up before it actually gets to that problem the astronauts are going to return to earth and you know everything's going to be as we understand it and, and know it that isn't to say that the die wraiths won't get to earth though as well so you know we, there could still be uh, a twist in this tale um, but we do get obviously the the next the element of the backup story and that's rom and, and nikomi uh, we always nikomi. we get um we get rom and nikomi obviously landing on that planet finding their their dead soul star brother on that ex plinth where sacrificial he was, plinth, yeah, yeah. where he was kind of killed and and as they're kind of as nakomi's kind of viewing what's going on it obviously he has the power to see like what actually happened he's viewing it and finding out what happens they the bridge is still there but they can't go through it for some reason i think it takes some more power than they have to actually get through that bridge but it's still there lying dormant uh, to get through to the moon or at least um you know closer to earth 
And as they're talking and discussing, you know, what happened and so on and so forth, the Soulstar Knight comes to and he's a dire wraith. That's right. So effectively, uh, yeah, Dorian has been left behind as a trap, as it turns out. And there's a di- so his armor is possessed by a dire wraith, and he immediately attacks Rom and Nikomi. So he kind of he blasts them, um, like an initial kind of blast. But Rom reveals during the conflict that you know your armor, that Elonian armor, cannot actually cause harm to us. He can't kill us. So in one last sort of ditch attempt, the, the dire wraith throws himself at the two Solstar Knights and pushes all of them through the the portal. Which is really cool. And again, to be concluded at the end, so we're going to see, you know, what actually happens there. Uh, and we also get a nice little look at the uh, the following issue cover, which is really dark, isn't it? Oh, God. That is, first off, it's, it's a superb piece of illustration. I love the retro look to it. Yeah, I love how the CP diorite time, heads yeah, are, yeah. Are, are done. It's... It's creepy as hell. And, and it's exactly how I'm expecting this uh, trilogy of episodes to wrap up. You think Neil, Buzz and Michael Collins are going to be diorates by the time they get back? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope that isn't the case, but it does insinuate that in the cover. Not not to say that, that will happen. It's just a very nice kind of, it could be a metaphorical thing and and most likely is actually but i yeah again really like the fact now that these two storylines are probably going to intertwine so now that rom and nikomi and this new diorath dorian are in the mix they're obviously going to have something to do with what happens next and it looks like they're in mars they're near mars that does look like you know it's a red planet that they've just appeared next to so they could have some journey still to do to get to to the moon and and to earth well actually i think even though it looks like it's a red planet i think it's i think it is the moon probably just the moon and you can see the you know far away you can see the earth that definitely looks like yeah you're right africa and, and america on you know sketched in there i'm gonna take that it's back. a better drawing of, i'm gonna take it's that a better back. drawing of south america than the one in at the last oh, disorder yeah. battle <laughs> yeah if you were listening to our, or watched our disorder battles you'll notice that i tried to uh side by side the two uh, maps and they're the completely different shapes so which is quite hilarious yeah so it, it's clearly they're going to have something to do with the uh the the end of this story which is pretty cool and a good way to tie them all together Yes, that brings us to the end of this particular issue. Brian, how did you feel about this one? Did it, was this was it just as good as the first? Uh, how did you how how are your feelings on this story so far? I'm really enjoying this. I think this is definitely up there with the first. Uh, it's lots of action. It's pretty dark. I wasn't expecting to see the good guys get such an ass kicking as they did. I thought probably like we all thought after the first issue that this was a, a nice setup to introduce some new characters. You know, reinvented characters from. I suppose Hasbro, Hasbro's, you know, catalogue of IP, and uh, they've been swiftly dispatched by the looks of it. So I think that um, Chris Royal is doing a superb job. The art team on this is again fantastic work. Uh, though my, my preference on the art is certainly the smaller kind of secondary story. Sal Bashema and Guy Dorian Senior. Sal Bashema yeah. and Guy Dorian Senior. Absolutely. Yeah, and. I have to agree. I've really enjoyed it so far. The first issue, I, I think, really surprised me. I was kind of like, you know, this is great. This is fantastic. This kind of, you know, t- continues that the feel and the atmosphere and the and the storyline kind of carries it on. I feel like, you know, if they're going to tie it up in one issue, like next, I think that's that's my main concern is that this isn't going to be going on for, you know, I, I was hoping for maybe five issues, uh, possibly six. But, you know, kind of doing it as a three-parter means that this is going to be kind of concluded very quickly. And it just kind of makes me a a bit sad that we don't get more out of this. But at the same time, it's going to make for a nice little contained storyline. We get the Inhumanoids kind of homages in there. And it's not like killing the characters of Inhumanoids necessarily. It is you know, killing characters that we, you know, that have just been brought in. So I feel like the connection to them isn't as strong. Although I will say that I'm really sad Kiev is dead because she was really cool. I thought she was brilliant. And a nice twist on Anatoly Kiev, who was in the Inhumanoids in the original series as Tankmaster. So I think it's like a, a cool little connection there. And I hope we do see... Anatoly, you know, Anatoly Kiev as an Inhumanoid further on in this kind of 
universe that um that they're doing in any case what would you give it in a potating rating brian gotta go with the five here i mean the guys are doing a great job and i know i said you know they, they they kind of broke the pacing of the action a little bit with the exposition in there but i can kind of forgive that i think it is necessary to get it in there you know that that's not going to stop me from going the full five sports for for this baby i'm only doing four and a half because of the fact that it's going to be concluded next issue and that <laughs> that's the only reason <laughs> the disappointment i felt when i saw that little those three little words in the bottom right hand section of that that page i was like oh oh that's a shame so that's that's kind of taking it down to four and a half for me um and also the fact that yeah like you say that break in play which I, I think is probably necessary but is it as necessary is it necessary to do it in that that way you know could that have been done maybe a bit quicker across or you know in smaller segments across the issue in their battles with the diorates the elements of that information could have crept out as opposed to be dumped at that stage right there. But again, I agree with you, and I love that backup story artwork. I think it's gorgeous. And yeah, can't wait for the next issue now. And I wonder when it's going to be. I mean, we're kind of like in a very unknown period of time for the comics industry. So our 50th comics burst could end up being our last, couldn't it? Well, do you know what? First off, the fact that we got the 50 comics burst is amazing, but I definitely do not want this to be the last. We don't know how long this whole COVID-19 thing is going to go on for. Certainly here in Ireland, we're looking at another month of lockdown. They've said straight out things won't be back to normal by Easter Sunday. Mm. We're expecting end of April before we get out of quarantine. And if that pattern is repeated in places like the US, like the UK, then the the hiatus on comic production and obviously distribution uh, is going to continue. So that's not a good thing. So the quicker we can all get back to normal, the quicker we can get back to consuming fantastic comics. I know. I think it's going to be, it's going to make a big difference not having it around. That's, that's my main issue. And obviously like, you know, G.I. Joe's now on hiatus. So we're not going to be doing any of the Paul Aller issues or the Real American Hero for a while. And, you know, you, you, we're in the middle of storylines, which is really like, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, timing, it could, it's obviously going to be bad whenever this kind of thing happens. But the fact that it's taken like we're on the last issue of ROM, we've got a really cool arc building in Paul Aller's story and we're in about halfway through Snake Hunt. So it's like. Oh, you know, this really is like agonizing. Talk about ending on cliffhangers. I know, like the whole, it's like our life is a cliffhanger right now. Uh, in any case, Brian, thanks for jumping on and chatting ROM with me. I really appreciate it, buddy. My absolute pleasure. Great comic. And for anyone that we haven't totally spoiled it for already, get out there and get this comic while you can and it'll keep you going while you're in lockdown like the rest of us buddy thank you very much for jumping on really appreciate it that's it for this special 50th installment of the full force comics burst thank you to my awesome co-host brian older than 50 hickey (laughs) see you next time and as always full force Make sure you get involved with the discussion by liking, sharing and commenting on these videos and as always you can keep up with the show after listening by following on Twitter at The Full Force, liking the Facebook page facebook.com forward slash The Full Force and if you would like to contact the show you can message us on either of those platforms with feedback or questions. We have also started a Patreon page so if you want to see your name up in lights on these videos or enjoy exclusive bonus content then check out patreon.com forward slash the full force podcast or click the link on any of the posts this podcast appears in full force and a big shout out to our sponsors distant planet comics and collectibles located at 601 business loop 70 west suite 263 located in the parkade center columbia missouri you can visit their website at distantplanetcomics.com and on facebook at facebook.com forward slash distantplanetcomics